<laughs> Michael Malice, are you there, sir? My giant head is here. You know, I've been seeing you on the news, uh, Fox News, and all over the place since the Trump meeting, and yeah. I can't help but scream at the TV, you're a fraud. <laughs> Correct. Why are you seen as this North Korea expert? You've never even been there. You're not in Korean. You don't understand what you're talking about. It's all a bluff. Do you remember the first time I got interviewed by you on your free speech podcast, I handed you my North Korea book and you go, oh, this came out a year ago. This is over. And you literally <laughs> tossed it aside and didn't want to talk about North Korea at all. Because <laughs> obviously the North Korean issue went away. <laughs> Well, I think it was a little petty that you single-handedly brought it back so you could be right <laughs> about a stupid argument. <laughs> yeah, that's the only re Right. I'm like, dude, you got to get nukes so I could get on Gavin's show. <laughs> but uh, let's take a step back here. So you literally wrote the book on North Korea. You've been there many times, right? Just once was plenty. The book, Dear Reader. Right, and and the problem with... And I gave you the hardcover, which is worth a lot of money now. The problem with going to North Korea... Uh, is you're given a very spe <clears throat> a specific route you can go on. Uh, you can go to certain events that they plan. You can't go wandering in North Korea. Yeah, and that sounds more ominous than it is because you can easily go on a planned excursion to like London or New York where they kind of take you around. So yes, but you're allowed to leave in London. Sure, but again, it's it, it's not ominous in that context. That you're you're barely spending time in the hotel. You're doing something all day. You know, they're taking you to places and events. Yeah, they're sanctioned events. Is Correct. It, <clears throat> what would happen if you're on these events? You left the, the the crew, and you took a picture of a kid who had no pants and was sitting on a pile of garbage having a cigarette. Nothing. Oh, really? I thought the host would be punished. No, so the, the, in recent, like basically the, how you have the tour company, the tour company partners with the Western tour company and the Western tour companies, because they just want foreign currency desperately, right? So the Western tour companies are like, we don't want the guides who are all brainwashed. We want the ones who think they're hip and edgy. So the ones that you get are like, yeah, just do what you want, except for like very few specific exceptions. They didn't ever look at my camera. Uh, you know, they talked sh it, 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 it's not like, and my, my, two of my friends went, it was the same situation with them. You're making North Korea sound very chill. <laughs> well, the guides are chill because the big question with North Korea is, do the people know that they're in a prison? And the yes. people at the top, no, they know it's all bullshit. It's like at the end of the Soviet Union. That's what I've been saying for a long time. If it was going to end, this is what the beginning of the end would look like. When people are like, okay, what the f is this shit? I'm sorry for cursing. Yeah, you're really going nuts with it, sailor boy. Right. Uh, well, I, I know the, that the lower classes, which I guess is 98% of the population. <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, yeah. I know they're, I saw them crying when Kim Jong-un's dad died, Kim Jong-il, and yeah. uh, I could see tears hitting the cement, and you saw the wet cement. So those were yeah. real tears. Uh, so it's a, so basically in that case, Kim Jong Il dying in uh, the the early nineties ninety four uh, excuse two thousand eleven uh, they were watching each other, so it had to be sincere or else you're going to get in trouble. Whereas when his father died, the great leader Kim Il Sung, who was the founder of North Korea in ninety four, and he'd been in charge of North Korea at that point for close to fifty years um, since the uh, since the forties. That was sincere because it was also like, holy crap, what happens next? He's the <laughs> only leader we've ever had. So there was that big fear there. But North Koreans are taught very much to cry all the time spontaneously. It's part of their culture. Uh, there was a Korean kid on the tour with us and this you know, waitress met him and she started crying. And she's like, oh, you're like a long lost son because they always talk about the tragedy of national division, which is something, you know, real to them. Right. So they cry. They're very big on public displays of emotion. Well, Kim Jong-un didn't see very, seem him very emotional when he was hanging out with Trump the other day. Well, he was too busy sweating. <laughs> I mean, he looked like Rosie O'Donnell with all that, beady, all that you know, sh shiny veneer. Okay, now we have to get to the derivative stuff that you do on every show. What did this meeting with Trump mean... I know that it, there's no certainty in the world, but is it consequential? The, the certainty in the world is that the corporate press will be the villains and the enemy. That's the one certainty you're going to have here. The reporting on this has been 
uh, reprehensible and, and unconscionable. Uh, first of all, it's absolutely possible that this will nothing will come of this. Worst case scenario, we're, we're ahead three hostages and the missile tests have stopped temporarily. That is literally the worst case scenario. Um, <laughs> the, the possibility- What about a nuclear war? But that was on the table before this session, you know what I mean? So that's a oh, wash. I, see. I got you. Uh, at the very least, we're ahead at, at almost no cost. The idea that this was somehow an embarrassment for Trump and this legitimizes Kim Jong-un, as, as Glenn Greenwell pointed out, what is Kim Jong-un gonna do with this so-called legitimacy? Use it to trade for rice? Use it to build bigger nukes? Like, what are you talking about? If you have nukes, you are legitimate. You have to respect someone with a huge gun, not in the sense of admire him, but acknowledge his power. It, it's, it, it's, and it's And the power he has over 25 million of his hostages. So this is a very positive step in what could be a positive direction. We've never had anything like this before. Peace is always preferable to war. And the fact that Trump isn't listening to the so-called experts uh, which is a flaw of his and, a, you know, uh, something in his favor in this case, after the, what they've tried hasn't worked, I think is driving them pretty obviously crazy. And they're responding in, in grotesque ways. Yeah, good point. It's not just the media that's going nuts with this and liberals. It's the establishment. It's the swamp. It's the deep right. state. They're right. all they've all been made superfluous by the, his independence. Right. And someone tweeted at me like, oh, Trump praising him, he really thinks Kim Jong-un's a great guy. And I'm like, then why would he care that he had nukes? We don't care that Britain has nukes. Right, yeah. Um, you know, I've noticed, and I wonder if you've noticed this too, despite this obvious success, which right. deserves a Nobel Peace Prize much more than Obama, you have all these never-Trumpers and liberals trivializing it. And it remind, we were talking about this yesterday on the show, how Bill Maher wants the economy to fail just right. to, to get Trump out. I honestly believe these people would love to see America burn. They'd love to see total chaos just for the one-upmanship so they can say, ha I told you so, Trump sucks. I, I made this point on Gutfeld's show yesterday, which is they are so invested in the idea that Trump is the worst president who we've ever had and could ever have that if he was just mediocre and just William McKinley, their credibility is shot. All he has to do is be at the like 25th percentile and everything that they said goes out the window. And if this were Obama, I mean, the, I mean, the, the, they, they would be saying he should have the Nobel Prize in perpetuity. Yeah, there'd and, be, under, and understandably. There'd be orgies in the streets. I, I, yes. They wouldn't be screaming at the skies. They'd be screaming on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I was in Williamsburg when Obama won and they were literally screaming at the, at the sky with joy. <laughs> standing on lampposts and mailboxes screaming in hysteria. I, I'm just going to quote the South Korean president where he said, uh, we don't care about if Trump gets the peace prize. We just want peace. I don't begrudge Obama that prize. Get that prize. That's fine. The point is the only thing that matters is peaceful liberation of the North Korean people. The end. That's it. So to, to summarize this, it was very consequential. It was very beneficial. It's a huge accomplishment for Trump. And anyone who says otherwise is being a complete pussy and the fact that we got him out of his house that's no small feat he's bunkered in pretty well there and we you know hollywood rules who gets up to sit at whose table we got him on a plane and we got his, his fat butt out of pyongyang that's a power move right trump putting his hands on him and showing him to go down the hall that's a power move these are all power moves even when he wrote that letter canceling the summit and Nancy Pelosi said, this reads like a Valentine to Kim Jong-un. The letter says, we're canceling the summit. This is a great opportunity for peace. We have the world's largest nuclear arsenal, and we pray to God we never have to use it. What kind of Valentine boasts about your nuclear arsenal? <laughs> Who are you dating, Nancy? <laughs> well, yeah, they always say Trump is an egomaniac, and he's all about show, and he's all about how he's perceived. And I think, yeah, that's the job of the president. I mean, you represent the entire country. You should be a narcissist. You represent me. How can you not be a narcissist and think <laughs> I should run the federal government? <laughs> and I'm going to spend two years of my life against brilliant, rich, qualified people, including in my own party, and be like, no, they're, they'd be terrible and I'd be wonderful even though we agree on every issue. What? <laughs> And be a narcissist. Be a peacock. You, you know, you you're essentially a, a human flag. I want you going like I, this. You have to have something, in my opinion, something really 
askew with you psychologically if you feel comfortable being like, I want to make decisions as to whether to send a nation to war. Yeah. Because that is such a big, intense moral question. I'm going to cause many mothers and fathers to have funerals. And to have the nerve to say that takes a certain kind of mentality. It takes a real man. And that's yeah. what we got with Trump. <laughs> yeah. Mike, thanks for being on the show, despite your total lack of knowledge with anything relating to North Korea. Thanks, Gavin. <laughs>